Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here and today I've got a very interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Custom Knife Factory and Bob Terzwola Eagle Rock. Wow. Um, you know, I I wasn't um, as early as far as like being aware of this. I wasn't as early as a lot of people. Somebody brought it to my attention and I was like, oh, wow, cool. You know, that's that's neat. A, a custom knife factory and Bob Trezwola collaboration. I did not know how enormous this knife was. I'm going to measure it for you here in a bit, but this has very quickly become one of my favorite ever CKF collaborations. And uh, spoiler alert, I'm very happy with it. Thanks so much to my patrons for supporting me. And please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. No, this was not provided to me by Terzwola or Custom Knife Factory. I just uh, bought it. Uh, from NC Blade. Uh, I was there right when they dropped and I paid for it in full. These came in three different configurations. Honestly, I have no idea if these are still available. You're welcome to check out NC Blade and see if they're still there. Um, we'll talk about the different configurations here in a sec. They were very expensive as is the case with CKF or Custom Knife Factory knives in general. Let's go ahead and measure it because that is holy moly. That is, <laughs> this knife is a freaking whopper, man. 9.75 inches. <laughs> I know it looks like nine and a half, right? But it's kind of a domed point of view. It truly is all of 9.75 inches. Blade length is coming in at 4.35. Cutting edge is coming in at four and a quarter. Monster. How about some size comparisons to put that into perspective up against the Ontario Rad Model 1 <laughs> and the Ontario Rad... Model 2, there we go. How about up against the Demco AD 20.5? How about up against the CJRB Pyrite, which you guys will see more often as a size comparison knife? How about up against the Spyderco Para 3 and the Spy... Where is it? Oh, the Spyderco PM2 is over here today. Okay, there we go. And last but not least, let's put it up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue and the Benchmade Bug Out. All righty. How's the action? Holy moly, the action is incredible. And using that little thumb disc, which I normally freaking hate. I hate thumb discs. They are almost never positioned correctly. This, much like um, it's uh, like the, the 0640 from ZT, it's one of few knives where the thumb disc thing is actually positioned correctly. And you know, the detent isn't super strong, uh, but because how stubby this flipper is, I mean, they force you to light switch this and it works, right? So whether you are deploying it, you know, whether you're doing like the reverse flick with it or you're doing the forward, it's much easier to do that. There's more room, there's more of a cutout on this side versus this side for access to, you can see how it's carved out right there. Much easier to deploy it this way. If you are left-handed, it's actually easier to deploy it like this, right? Um, but uh, you'll notice that there's no cutout for lefty carry. So yeah, great. Why'd you even tell us that complex? Sorry. It is very easy to deploy and very, very satisfying to deploy. There is a lot of blade and it, whoo, it really feels like a small machete. Um, it is ridiculous. Access to the titanium, yes, titanium liner lock is plentiful. Uh, and uh, the bearings on the inside... Um, allow for, I think they're staggered. They're either multi-row or staggered. Some people look at staggered bearings and say multi-row. Ceramic, at least staggered. There's lots of bearings in there, right? Super smooth, crazy smooth, very, very good. Um, let's go ahead and um, do carry profile. This is not going to be the easiest knife in the world to carry versus something like the Spyderco Para 3. It is absolutely thicker. Not monstrously thick, but definitely noticeably thicker. Length and height up against the PM2 and Para 3. You're going to notice this, right? A lot of people, you know, okay, if you carry the Cold Steel 4 Max, right? Come on out. I know all you guys are waiting. I was like, I'm not as big as my Cold Steel 4 Max. Yeah, great. Did you know that that knife is accessible to everybody? It's not a knife that you have to, like, go, you know, take a test or go to Knife Hogwarts. And you can just buy it. Like, anybody can just give money and be like, yeah, okay, and I've got it now, right? So, um, yeah, it's not as big as a Cold Steel 4 Max. Great. But... For people who carry, I would say, normal 
size pocket knives, right? The vast majority of people, this is going to come off as a bigger knife. It's going to feel like a bigger knife. You know, you're going to notice it in your pocket for sure. Let's go ahead and weigh it. What are the materials on this one? Um, so there were three different options. There was stone washed. Sorry, I'm getting my fingerprints off of this stone washed S 90 V with a red and black carbon fiber and titanium bolster for 620 bucks, something like 620 to 640, something in there. Um, then there was this one for the same price with the black uh, marble carbon fiber zirconium. Yes, this is, it's like a flat chalky zirconium uh, bolsters on both sides, uh, zirconium backspacer. And then the CKF wash, which is almost like a glass blasted or vapor blasted blade in S90V, same price, right? And then for some weird reason, they did carbon fiber and titanium, titanium bolster with a stonewashed, uh, stonewashed S110V blade for way more. What do they want over it? Like it was like a hundred dollars more. No idea. Congrats to the people who got those. That's great if you really want the collector element. In my opinion, far and away, the best buy was this one. Zirconium, are you kidding? Zirconium, and you get the, the unique blade in S90V. I'd rather have S90V than 110V anyway, but I think that comes down to preference. To me, this was the best looking one. So this is the heaviest version. That might be the downside for some people is the added weight of the zirconium, but it's zirconium carbon fiber in S90V. Uh, so just keep in mind the titanium variants are gonna weigh a little bit less. This guy comes in very chunky at 7.23 ounces. Balance on this knife is, <laughs> It's actually right behind the pivot, so it's really not all that bad, but it, it, you're, you're going to notice the weight. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, the balance is so good that you don't notice the weight. Nah, I'm pretty aware. It's a, it's a heavy, a heavy boy. Let's go ahead and measure the blade stock thickness on this knife. Uh, blade stock thickness is coming. Oh, trying to get, let's get it right in the middle of the table. Blade stock thickness is coming in at probably want to see that 140 it's probably 150 thousandths I think that's pretty typical for CKF hardware check I'm going to get out my tools as per usual my tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable you can find them right down in the section of my description that talks about the tools I use on this channel it's either T8 or T10 I bet it's T oh it might be it might be a T10 maybe I'm wrong let's try there's a T10 and diddly doo. It is T10 on both sides. How about the handle hardware? Is it? No, that's T8. And then there's going to be some screws back here. This is a simple sandwich construction knife. There's a few more screws than normal, but not bad. They're using all large size fasteners, at least on the outside. Even if they're using smaller ones on the inside, it won't be that difficult to take apart. You do have one hidden screw underneath for the pocket clip. Uh, make sure you have the right tools for the job and a place to put the hardware and you should be good to go. All right. Time for meat and potatoes. This is a good looking knife. Oh boy. So Bob Terzola literally wrote the book on the tactical folding knife. Did you know that? If you want to know what the tacticaliest tactical that ever tactical was, you can, I think it's actually pretty rare and kind of expensive. Uh, you can try and find his book on the tactical folding knife. All right. He's got a few models that look very similar. Uh, ATCF, I think, is what he's famous for, or ACTF. I always get that mixed up. Who is this guy? Who is this guy who calls himself a knife review? He doesn't even know what Bob Terswell is famous for? All right, sorry, right? I like the look of these. They certainly do look tactical, right? Um, at base, it is a um, very aggressive-looking liner lock that has a very uh, traditional knife handle profile and traditional blade profile um, where it starts to get unique is on this one in particular is the compound grind you have a thicker grind primary uh, thicker primary grind and it actually is thinner out here both grinds i think are still flat um it's not like hollow it's not like a compound like hollow and flat it's it's flat and flat it's just like thick and kind of thick and it is <laughs> it's sharpened very well it certainly is sharp enough to slice you know a lot of people think that knives like this, um, you know, are not ground in a way that's going to allow them to slice. But see, even down here, yeah. In fact, it's actually doing a better job than I thought that it would, right? It's definitely thicker down at the bottom, but can it slice? Well, yeah, it, of, of course it can. Are you kidding? Um, 
not everything needs to be able to skin a grape. But yeah, using this, uh, you know, as a, as a knife that you just go out and do regular work with, it, it's going to work just fine, right? How many people will do that? I don't know. But it, it, I mean, it really only it only matters to the people who buy it, right? If you're not buying this, then why do you care whether or not people use it? People decide who decide to use it. Great, yeah, it'll hold up to it. I think that this zirconium will scratch. I mean, zirconium is pretty hard, but the finish on this you're going to notice, right? You're going to get little snail trails in it and things like that. It's just going to be the nature of the beast. The carbon fiber and zirconium, all of this look really great. I got to point this out. A lot of people told me that there were, people initially were saying things like, everybody's having problems with it. No, a little bit of research told me that there were a couple of YouTube uh, knife reviewers who had issues with theirs. Now, that's enough to tell me that, you know, that's enough of an indicator to say, uh, there's probably more that had some issues. People were talking about fit and finish issues between the bolster and the scale. People were talking about detent lash issues. Like when the blade was in the closed position, there's wiggled. Mine doesn't wiggle at all. Mine is completely, mine is completely solid. It doesn't move at all. I'm happy to say that this one is perfect. I have zero fit and finish issues with it, but if you're looking to pick one of these up brand new or on the secondary market, just know there were at least a few people who had some fit and finish issues, which is a bummer because CKF with, you know, for me, their manufacturing has always been like top tier. So I don't know what the deal was with that, but I am going to point it out, right? Because I heard about it and went and watched the videos and listened to other people. So that's yeah, kind of a bummer. Ergonomically, pretty darn comfortable. It does, it feels pretty big and bricky, but the edges of this brick are all knocked down. Even these areas that could, you know, create some hot spots or sharp spots for some people, all knocked down. The pocket clip, I know people don't like that they put Derzola on there. I think NC Blade or CKF is actually offering clips for this that don't say Terzola on it. I don't know. I'm not going to change mine. I don't really care that much, but it is kind of like, wow, you know, it's really, it's, there's already billboarding out here. I don't know why we had to put this right here, but yeah, I agree. They probably didn't need to do that. This is pretty comfortable. And I mean, there's honestly, there are three separate full four finger positions for this knife here, the standard grip, and even choked up where there is plenty of room to get right behind the blade. There's also a nice uh, you know, complimentary bit of jimping right here on this ramp. Really, really cool. These are all numbered. I don't know how many there were of each type. Mine's number 37, says S90V, Terzola design. I actually kind of like how that looks. It looks the best from the front. And I appreciate that they did this. They really just put CKF on the bolster and then left it all just open for everybody to look at. I appreciate without any billboarding. There is a fuller in the blade, but it's pretty much inaccessible. You, some people might be able to dig at it, right, and flip it out that way. But for the most part, you're not going to be deploying it that way. This blade, as far as, you know, symmetry on both sides, right, comparing one side to the other, is absolutely perfect. The blade is beautiful. I think the CKF wash looks far and away the best. Some people don't like it, but, man, I, I looked at the tumbled ones, and I was like, these are fine. I'm going for the zirconium and, and S90V variant. I know a lot of people agreed with me, right? For some reason, they made very few S110V variants and a bunch more of this and the red carbon fiber ones, which I think is great. I'm glad that more people were able to get a hold of, you know, the one that, in my opinion, at least looks better. Um, but yeah, uh, the blade is just great. I would imagine that you can take this off and replace it with many different styles of custom thumb disc things. I think they're all pretty similar in size. And if they're not, if there's not like a universal size, then I would imagine you could get them sized pretty easily. So it's kind of an interesting little level of customization. We do have a little Timascus pivot collar, which is a nice touch. I gotta admit, I kind of wish that they had done polished zirconium bolsters, much like, um, Kind of, uh, let me see here. Do I have something that's polished Zerk? So I got some oil slick, right? I kind of wish that we went with this polish. This is oil slick zirconium. This is black DLC, polished black DLC. It's also CKF. Kind of want zirconium that looks like this for the bolsters. I think that would have looked a lot cooler, especially, um, you know, in, uh, doing the backspace for the same way. I just need to put these back where they're supposed to go. Um, but yeah, 
uh, like doing the polished backspacer, polished bolsters, and then having the black wash titanium liners for contrast and, and you know, the carbon fiber in the pocket clip, I think that would have looked excellent. They probably would have charged us more money for that, but I honestly would have paid it, right? We'll talk about price here in a sec. Um, by the way, I don't think they did any, oh no, they did. Holy crap, I've actually never noticed that. They did actually um, carve those liners out for um, uh, weight reduction. So this is a liner lock. I gotta, I gotta say something. Uh, it's mostly on my shorts, so like my YouTube shorts, which I don't, I don't take the comments too seriously on YouTube shorts. I know that YouTube is kicking those out to um, people who are not super familiar with the knife world. But I know that there, you know, maybe there's just some new people here, some people who just don't have a firm grasp on, you know, what makes a knife cost more money. Something fairly common that I hear is uh, that much money for a liner lock. What makes you think that the lock itself is a major factor when it comes to price? What makes you think that certain locks belong in exclusive tiers? That is certainly the case for some materials. We don't want to see FRN on a $1,000 knife. Uh, we don't want to see 8CR 13 MOV steel on a, you know, Four, five, six, seven hundred dollar knife, thousand dollar knife, right? I mean, kind of extreme examples there with the pricing. But the lock, um, if you're new, let me tell you, uh, not only is it not an issue for a liner lock to be on an expensive knife, they're actually extremely prominent in the ultra mega super exotic high end custom knife world and have been that way for a long time. So if you're saying that, it means you're not familiar with that tier of the knife world. You're not familiar with what makes a knife expensive in the first place. If this is your first time hearing this or you found yourself assuming this, let me break down those walls for you. Liner locks are not exclusive to a certain tier. We see them all the time in expensive knives. It is not a major factor when determining how to price the knife. That is such a weird thing that people do. Blah, much money for a liner lock? Blah! Because you can get a liner lock at Walmart for, uh, what, 40 bucks? Um, listen, there's a pretty big difference between this knife and that $40 knife that you got at Walmart that also has a liner lock. That's pretty much the only thing that's similar is that the locks are labeled as the same type of thing. But the amount of work that went into it which is a much more potent piece of information when it comes to trying to figure out how the thing should be priced, right, the value on it. That's totally different. <laughs> Stop thinking that. That's so weird. <laughs> Such a weird thing that I hear. Um, but anyways, yeah, we have a titanium liner lock that does have a steel lock bar insert, something that your $40 knife will not have. I'm not trying to flex and be a jerk or anything like that. I'm just saying, like, there are many differences. Titanium. Liner lock, steel lock bar insert on the inside, which is nice. I'm really glad that they went ahead and did that. That's a nice touch, right? Um, the pocket clip is mounted lower than I would have expected. There's quite a bit of butt sticking up out, but then you consider like how, what percentage of the knife is actually in your pocket. And it's quite a bit, right? In and out of the pocket, super easy. I love this pocket clip. Knocked down at the, at the corner so we don't have sharpness. We have exactly what I've always talked about. We have a rise, a drop, and a slight swoop easy in and out of the pocket would have preferred that it was mounted slightly back here right you'll notice that the king of tactical folding knives bob terzola literally the guy who wrote the book on the tactical folder um oh <laughs> I was about to say he put he didn't put a lanyard hole on it. This is the first time that I've even noticed that there was a lanyard hole on it. That's how little I care about. It. Okay, I was about to be like, you notice how the tactical, the god of tactical tacticalness didn't put a lanyard thing on the tactical. Yeah. All right. Well, you guys got me there. He did actually include one. So there you go. You can still tactical with the lanyard if you really, if that's how you tactical. Um, <laughs> whoops. Uh, but yeah, uh, in and out of the pocket, very easy. Really wish that he would have mounted this for lefties. That would have been great. I think lefties would still very much enjoy this, especially flipping it, uh, reverse flipping it. Left-handed is actually easier than right-handed. Is S90V the right steel for this? S90V is... Um, a lot better composition than I used to think. And while 
I, I think that there are better compositions for this geometry and this size of blade. Boy, S90V really does drive it home when you're spending a lot of money on a knife, right? We're all sick of M390. We also all, and well, most of us know that S90V is a more expensive composition when it comes from, you know, when it comes down to like companies purchasing steel to turn into a knife. S90V is absolutely more expensive steel. It will hold an edge longer. It's not quite as stainless, but it is still a stainless steel. In my experience, the toughness is relatively similar. Uh, if not, it's actually maybe a little bit better. I found that S90V is not quite as chippy as properly heat treated M390. That's just my experience. But yeah, the edge retention on properly heat treated S90V will absolutely be better than S90V. So getting S90V on a knife like this that is very expensive, while it might not be the best the best choice, right? Especially if people use this how it's intended to be used, right? Hard use cutting tool slash tactical weapon. <laughs> I'm not going to use it that way, but uh, you know, it, it's probably not the best composition, but it sure does feel good, I guess is what I'm saying. Lock up. Let's take a look here. Your stop pin is, to my knowledge, it is, yeah, it's internal, but it is fixed in place. So the there's a little channel carved in the blade. It's locking out here in combination with the liner lock. There is absolutely no blade play up, down, left, or right. I don't know if this is an issue that other people had, but mine, if it is an issue, mine is locking up completely and totally solid. Here's your lockup geometry. There is zero, and I mean zero, lock stick, extremely smooth action, extremely. And then as you can see here, we have dead centering, perfect. Zero. I'll move this while you guys look at the tip here so that you know. Mine has no movement whatsoever. This is one of my favorite CKF knives in existence. I love this thing. It's huge. It's ridiculous. It's made with premium materials. It's made with premium finishes. I wish that the bolsters were polished, but they're not, and I can live with that. Holy crap, is it expensive. You are definitely going to pay a premium for a CKF knife. In all reality, and in, in all honesty, I don't think that this knife um, should be more than about 550 bucks, maybe 525. I think it's about, I think it's like a hundred bucks over. But you know, it's one of those things where <laughs> I obviously internally somewhere felt like it it was worth it because I paid for it. Uh, you're gonna pay more for what you for what you like aesthetically, and this is absolutely an example of that. I think CKF is getting a little bit crazy with their prices, and once these are all gone, if they are all gone from NC Blade, you can expect to pay more for these things on the secondary market, right? That's just what's gonna happen. If you want to get in at even remotely fair on these things, you gotta be ready to pick them up when they drop, right? Don't be that person who's just consistently complaining about having to spend more money on the secondary market. Learn. Stop being last. Pay attention to CKF's Instagram or whoever they're collaborating with and learn when they're going to drop. Because that, honestly, it's the only way to get an even remotely fair price. If you're sitting around going, oh, I don't know what to do. All this, all, all, everything's terrible on the secondary market. Yeah, it is. It is. It's been that way for a long time. Secondary market pricing is crap because people do that. They they jack they, they buy this stuff and they flip it on the secondary market. It sucks. Yes, you're right about that, right? And everybody who's ever complained about it has been right for the last however long it's been happening. Five decades or ten decades, right? So stop waiting. Follow CKF, follow their website, sign up to their newsletter, right? Follow these guys so that you can figure out when this stuff is going to drop. And I know that's going to, some people are going to get mad at me for that, but that's the truth with a lot of this stuff. If you don't want to have to pay the super insane price tags, then you're going to have to settle for the initially kind of insane price tag. I don't agree with the pricing on this, right? Not as far as value goes. I think that when it comes down to value and materials and all of that, I think there are definitely better knives that you can get for, for less, right? This was the best one of the bunch. I certainly do not recommend this to the average person. It is way too expensive, just generally speaking, even if it was a good value, right? It's way too expensive, it's monstrous, and it clearly caters to the enthusiast collector. However, if you are an enthusiast collector and you can get this for a fair price, then yes, I would recommend it to you, especially if you like larger knives. 
Um, so this isn't a knife that I'm going to put in my recommended knives playlist, but I am going to put it in my favorite knives of all time playlist. If that's confusing to you, let me try and make it clear. I am an enthusiast collector. I do like big knives and I'm a fan of Bob Terzuola and CKF or Custom Knife Factory. So this was kind of a dream come true for me and it's how I you know, justified this price tag, but it's not going to be that way for everybody. I just want to be open, honest, and clear about why I'm putting it in there. It's absolutely one of my favorite knives of all time, but it's freaking overpriced. That's going to be pretty much it today. Wow, what a monster. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.